All right, so welcome back, and um, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much to all of our panelists on our last panel. Um, and we are going to move on now to our second panel, which is on conflict resolution to combat hate crimes. Um, and as you can see, we have a lot of um, community representatives and CRS representatives on this panel. Um, and so I'm very excited, particularly about this part. Um, and so we, we heard a lot about what, what hate crimes are and what kind of enforcement mechanisms we have. Um, there was also a wonderful metaphor in the last panel um, describing the effect of a hate crime similar to a, a pebble being dropped in a still lake and these types of ripples, and that these ripples become a part of the community, a part of community relations. And so I think um, a lot of what we may be hearing in, in this next panel will really be speaking to how do we deal with these things within a community? And um, how do we resolve this conflict? How do we work together as a community to live together um, and, and to try to live in, in peace and in recognition of one another? Um, so I'm going to pass over to um, Ms. Kathy O'Quinn, who is going to be one of the moderators of this panel. And she will introduce our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to introduce uh, to my right, I have uh, Ms. Daphne Felton Green, who will also co moderate with me. And she's uh, our senior counsel at CRS, so she has a fine understanding of a lot of the issues that will be discussed today. Uh, seated next to her is Mr. Harpreet Singh Moka, who is the Mid Atlantic Regional Director uh, for CRS. And so he handles cases uh, here on the East Coast. Um, and next to uh, him is Ms. Catherine Oakley, and uh, Ms. Oakley is legislative counsel at the Human Rights Campaign, and so she will be able to share stories of um, conflicts that affect the whole, the entire community, conflicts that occur uh, rooted in bias, and how that affects more than just those who are um, a direct party to the conflict. And seated next to Ms. Oakley is Mr. Michael Lieberman. Uh, he is. Washington Council and Director uh, of the Anti-Defamation League, and he has a very fine understanding of different fact patterns, or really just different types of behaviors and, and what they communicate to the community as a whole. And he can really help um, give us a fine understanding of uh, what kinds of actions cause that rippling effect. Um, and lastly, Director Grand Lum, he's the director of CRS, and uh, he will also uh, speak about the types of conflict resolution tools CRS conciliators use in the field to address, um, address the tension and unrest that spreads through a community when uh, a, a bias incident occurs. So uh, we'll start with Mr. Harpreet Singh Milka. Hello, everybody. Everybody hear me? Is this working? Um, thank you uh, for having me on this panel. I feel a, a little intimidated. We have an all-star list of folks here. Uh, and so uh, I will do my best to uh, come to the level and what have you. Um, I'm going to speak on um, CRS's response to religious bias hate crimes. And in particularly, I'm going to talk about um, the incidences that happened last August in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Um, but before I go there, last night I drove down to the Washington, D.C. area. I'm uh, headquartered in Philadelphia, and uh, I oversee the Mid-Atlantic region, which includes the District of Columbia, Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and West Virginia. Um, and <clears throat> I'm also uh, practicing C. And uh, uh, yesterday I came, uh, I came over to my cousin's house and we were sitting around and he had a friend there too. And uh, we were talking about what I do and we were talking about 9-11 and where were you during 9-11? And so within the Sikh community, it's a, uh, well, not only the Sikh community, but outside the Sikh community, where were you during 9-11? And what did you do? How did you cope? How did you survive? What happened? Um, and then the next, question was, where were you August 5th? And I was um, in, um, I took my wife and her brother to go eat at this new burger place called uh, Bobby Flay's. Bobby Flay's this big um, uh, chef and what have you. And we were at Bobby Flay's and I got a call from a friend of mine, a community advocate, saying 
Harpreet, do you know what happened? And I go, no, I'm enjoying my milkshake, and this is my cheat day, and I'm going to enjoy my burger and shake. And uh, I do add humor into the serious thing so I can cope with it. It's my personal coping mechanism. Um, but <clears throat> from then on, uh, it was game on. And you know, I started getting news reports. More people started calling, saying, Harpreet, there's something happened. There's something very serious happened. And um, I was actually on my way to a regional all staff conference in Dallas, Texas. And immediately I was in contact with the director at that time um, of CRS and the regional director who oversees uh, Wisconsin Air and what have you. And <clears throat> basically, a um, whole host of issues come to your mind. How many, who's the shooter, what's the cause, what's happening. But I had to <clears throat> separate that and put my uh, CRS turban on and be, I need to think like uh, impartially and neutrally and be focused on what are the key issues here. Uh, because I was going to, I knew from that time on that I was gonna be hands-on involved in this uh, crisis and we needed to, to act quickly. And so issues that um, we come about when we look at these kind of incidences are initially, of course, panic. The community is in panic that someone has entered a place of worship and started firing has killed five people and then ultimately kills himself. And now what do people do? Where do people go? What are their concerns? How do they get help? Um, in addition, you worry about uh, that with this community, the Sikh community is relatively, uh, they've uh, recent immigrants, even though Sikhs have been in this country for over 100 years, uh, the population there in Oak Creek, Wisconsin was uh, fairly new. It's been around since last 30 to 40 years, but they had many recent immigrants. And with recent immigrants, you have issues always of immigration and the fear of interacting with law enforcement, federal law enforcement, what have you. In addition, um, from countries of, uh, in South Asia, you have issues of um, fear of law enforcement. You rather not deal with law enforcement than, um, uh, than deal with them. And that same kind of attitude is carried on here. And that's something that's key to assisting a community that has suffered such an uh, incredible incident. Um, you worry about and you have to address fears of copycat crimes or will it happen again. Um, and then you have to deal with issues of how will we respond. Who are the people that we need to gather to um, identify as state, local, federal leaders that can assist us at this time? In addition, even more important is identifying key individuals in the community who are community leaders. And you have to do this in a very relative short amount of time um, because you have so much going on in a short period of time. I mean, everything was happening um, so quickly that day, August 5th, but finding out who, um, who the people are, who are the people on the ground, who can be uh, best to uh, speak to, arrange meetings, provide assistance, provide um, information to the community. So in addition to identifying key community leaders, identifying uh, advocacy organizations within those communities. Now I've picked this, uh, a Creek example because that's the most recent, but this applies for um, a lot of the cases that we handle in the religious context, is that we work hand in hand with the local religious leaders um, and not only the community that has suffered uh, or has perceived to have suffered that crime, but also the interfaith community that also helps us and that they can help us in building coalitions and addressing and moving things along. Also, um, addressing issues of education. Uh, when we had um, the Oak Creek uh, shootings happen, uh, we had very clear uh, questions from law enforcement that we didn't even know the Sikh community lived in our, uh, our neighborhood. Not necessarily in Oak Creek, but in other areas across the country. So we have to familiarize them with uh, the practices of those, uh, of that tradition, uh, of the culture, and what have you. Uh, luckily, 
um, CRS after 9-11 had sat down with uh, leading Arab, Muslim, and Sikh uh, advocacy organizations and created a program called Arab, Muslim, and Sikh 101s. And we conduct those um, nationwide, and we've conducted quite a few after the Oak Creek um, incident in educating um, federal law enforcement, local law enforcement, and state law enforcement about uh, who are we dealing with. Because the first thing we need to do is understand who we're dealing with so we can move forward in addressing issues of concern that they may have, whether it be immigration, whether it be hurdles or challenges they face in practicing their religion, or whether it be uh, school bullying, employment discrimination, or um, whether it be um, issues uh, that deal with uh, domestic <coughs> social issues and moving forward, um, or uh, kids dealing with school bullying issues and moving forward. Um, in addition, in, in these kind of um, situations, you have to identify very quickly um, victims assistance programs uh, through not only the U.S. Attorney's Office, but the FBI and your other federal partners. So as a person who works for CRS, you have to know, uh, you have to do some preparation that, hey, you have to know what kind of programs uh, the U.S. Attorney offers, uh, what programs the FBI offers, and then you have to kind of, you have to kind of sew it all together, or puzzle it through, and go from there. Um, and you have to deal with uh, questions and concerns and issues of a community has faced um, such a horrific incident, they are now scared about their home, protecting their homes, protecting their uh, worship centers, uh, protecting um, their kids in school. And how do you go about uh, helping them or facilitating a dialogue where they can uh, know what to ask. Because at the end of the day, um, this community did not know what they didn't know. So uh, they needed to understand that what, uh, how could they get help and what kind of help is out there. So basically, those were kind of like a summary of issues that we at CRS look at these kind of incidences. And we do this in a, uh, a very uh, quick time frame because we have to puzzle it all together and see that where can we connect the dots? Where can we help people? Where can we facilitate a dialogue? Where can we help in providing best practices? Where can we help in providing uh, technical assistance or providing consulting um, to uh, our federal partners and in assisting uh, uh, communities with their community tension regarding the incident. Now, at CRS, we don't investigate, we don't prosecute, um, uh, and we're very confident. We have confidentiality clause in our enabling statute and what have you, so we're uh, very cognizant of those ideas. But on the same hand, we are part of the Department of Justice and we are a federal presence. But we are here to, um, in short, enable and assist the community and then pull out. And that's what we uh, try to do in, in, in going into communities when there has been either a perceived um, incident relating to violent hate crime but, or an actual incident. We're not there to judge uh, whether it is one. We're there to assess the community tension and to assist them in trying to address that uh, tension that they have there. So mm, a number of steps that we we did, we've done after uh, in Oak Creek and nationwide, and I can pretty much talk more, excuse me, about, um, about what we did in my region. That we sat down um, with our Sikh and Muslim leadership across the five states and um, the District of Columbia, and we sat down, we heard their concerns. They were very concerned that even though this incident happened in Wisconsin, that we would have a copycat crime here. And they had concerns about their kids. They had concerns primarily of safeguarding uh, their worship centers, their gurdwaras, their mosques, their synagogues, and what have you. And they wanted to know what they could do. Um, we're lucky uh, that um, Washington, D.C. is a very, uh, lack of a better word, sophisticated uh, population than they they're very connected and they, uh, they know what to do, but still we have uh, a large um, uh, number of uh, 
people who are still uh, in not in the know and they need uh, this information and also understanding that language may be uh, a big issue. Uh, in the earlier panel um, in Oak Creek we identified very quickly that we needed uh, access to language access programs or people who could translate into Punjabi. And that's very key because how can you assess people if you don't know the language they speak or vice versa. And in each one of our community uh, engagements, uh, meetings and dialogues, we always had uh, a translator there. And some of them were uh, from the law enforcement field and then some of them were the community members who volunteered to um, uh, translate and uh, convey the message that we were uh, conveying to them. Um, so basically, bringing people together. But um, in, these, in these kind of situations, people are in a crisis mode, and they want to speak to somebody who can help them. And so what we did is we created um, and we organized community meetings with law enforcement agencies, whether it be federal, local, or state. And we invited all of them to the table, and we sat down and we identified the key Sikh Muslim and other leaderships and brought them to the table and we facilitated a dialogue with both of them so they could identify and address their key issues of concern because we're not the advocate we're not advocating for them we're providing them the forum so they can address their issues and so in doing that um, you also have to provide best practices to both parties and what to ask how to ask it to be uh, respectful of cultural norms or or, or what have you in that consent, in that kind of situation, because there are many sensitivities that you have to be aware of. In this case, um, we had to be cognizant of that um, we had to do a lot of um, uh, uh, consulting and best practices on how the Sikh community deals with uh, uh, tragedy. How do they deal with loss? And that not only did um, something in Wisconsin uh, affect the people in Wisconsin, but it affected the Sikh community nationwide and worldwide, and that uh, a community has been assaulted in a place of worship where uh, one goes for refuge and peace and solace, and that's the last place you would think that you would be attacked. Uh, in fact, uh, understanding and going in a little deeper, uh, the Sikh Gurdwara is a place of social, economic, uh, political center for the Sikh community. So you're, in a sense, attacking their epicenter. And so understanding that and conveying that to people that you're uh, dealing with, whether it be first responders, or whether it be um, uh, the U.S. attorney, and what to say, what not to say, uh, when he is conveying um, his thoughts, um, and when he is discussing issues. Um, in addition, um, giving them uh, providing federal enforcement um, a list of issues that are key, uh, are like their top ten issues. Like in the case of Oak Creek, it, um, uh, the investigation, initially um, they were uncertain of how many shooters there were and what have you. Of course, CRS doesn't have any do things, but we conveyed that very quickly that this is something that the community feels is uh, very near to dear to them, and then how are they going to not only safeguard the uh, Sikh Gurdwara, which is the Sikh community's place of worship, which is uh, open to everyone. So there is not a, uh, there's not any barrier of entry. Anybody can come in and that can actually uh, be uh, challenging in that um, you have to be very cognizant of who's entering and who's not. Even after uh, the Oak Creek shootings, a couple months afterwards, uh, there was an individual who walked in who um, had a pistol and what have you, and afterwards uh, it raised quite a, uh, quite a bunch of alarms and what have you. Um, fortunately, it was nothing uh, very serious, but now there's more of, a, um, more of a feeling that we need to be aware of your surroundings and conveying that and having law enforcement provide those best practices and share with them. And then, uh, in this case, uh, having folks from the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Civil Rights Division, and the FBI speaking to how to report hate crimes. Um, what do you go about to? Who do you report to? Do you report to your state folks, your county folks, um, or do you call everybody 
and who do you work with? So I think those are, the, those are some key challenges that we do in <coughs> capturing um, those key issues at this meeting and facilitating the dialogue and moving it, uh, moving it forward. And then <clears throat> towards the end, um, having um, uh, law enforcement identify who their key liaisons are, building rela long-lasting relationships with communities, and also providing them um, some kind of avenue so they can either join a task force. Many um, um, chief of police have these task forces or uh, hate crimes task forces that will uh, provide a forum where various communities can uh, come together and voice their concerns on a whole bunch of issues and promoting that or uh, helping um, law enforcement uh, forming one of those. And then in addition, promoting um, an ongoing um, relationship where uh, the police or the law enforcement and the community have uh, mutual liaisons where that in case of something does happen in the near future, it's you know that John's there and I'm going to pick up the phone, he's on speed dial and going from there. And it's, it's assisting um, communities and law enforcement in building that relationship and then moving forward so uh, they can uh, address issues as they come about. And then uh, providing or identifying support agencies that can also, like Human Relations Commission, that can also provide assistance in addressing local issues regarding religious hate crimes and what have you. And then also following up and maintaining that contact. Uh, we, uh, uh, because we are uh, short staffed and um, we have few people, what we do is we go into um, situations, um, do what we have to do, whether it be training, facilitating dialogue, or conducting mediations, and then after that, we slowly pull out providing uh, resources so the communities feel like they have support with them and then we ease out and go uh, go forward to to the next incident and this basic um, outline that I did of issues and then steps applies to not only the Oak Creek situation but other situations where we have of say we had vandalism of a mosque here in Fairfax Virginia last year or we have vandalism of a synagogue, um, or we had the attack on the uh, Holocaust Museum, where we identify uh, both our community resources and we identify our key leadership in law enforcement. Um, challenges in D.C. is that we have so many different kind of um, law enforcement, so where you have C uh, Secret Service, you have Park Police, you have MPD, and what have you, and working with all of them to conduct trainings. And then, um, key is that working with community groups and building coalitions, building coalitions uh, of various communities, uh, working with the clergy, working with um, your neighborhood uh, committees, and going from there and addressing uh, issues together, and providing those resources so they can address issues. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, being not only tolerant, but uh, being respectable and identifying uh, people's concerns. Because at the end of the day, people are people, and we all have similar concerns. And um, in the Oak Creek example, um, I personally saw that interfaith community would come knocking or calling, uh, would visit the Secretaries in the area and say, we want to help you, and we want to provide support. Let us help you. We want to uh, share in your grief. We want to move things forward. And that's, uh, that's been tremendous in moving. Uh, moving things because those communities have resources that maybe um, the city community ha didn't have and now <coughs> they can work together in addressing those. So at CRS we are there to facilitate move, um, move resources where people can attain them and move people closer together where they can uh, address issues um, and know who they can address issues to. So that's kind of my uh, general overview of how, uh, how we'll, uh, things evolved and what we did uh, in Region 3 in the aftermath of Oak Creek and also um, the process we followed uh, nationwide in addressing um, uh, this uh, serious religious hate crime um, and go from there. 
So uh, with that, I'm going to hope I haven't taken too much time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move it to Kate. Thank you. So I'm going to pull the ripples out a little bit more. We were talking about this ripples analogy, and I'm going to follow the ripples out a little bit more. Um, my organization does work on LGBT uh, equality specifically. And so I'm, I just want to talk a little bit about when a hate crime happens or when we're in an environment where hate crimes are known to happen, how that affects the community and how that makes everybody sort of feel and react in response. Um, one of the things that's m one of my responsibilities in my job is that I go to different cities and I talk to cities about how they can make their city policies more inclusive. And at the end of a conversation that I had with uh, the president of a city council of a southern city, as this man is walking me out, he says, well, I, he's a straight ally, and he said, I had someone tell me that there was recently a survey done in my city and that the majority of LGBT people who live in my city would not feel comfortable holding the hand of their partner as they walk down the street. And he felt really upset about that. And I felt not remotely surprised about that. And I was glad that he was upset, and he said, okay, so what do I do? And that is an incredibly complicated question that I cannot answer between the door of his office and the door of the building. So <laughs> I suggested that we perhaps have a follow-up conversation about it. But I mean, there is, this isn't a community where there was recently some kind of an incident, some kind of a hate crime incident that's out there that's sort of out in the cloud. The difference is it's just in a state that's known to be hostile to LGBT people. And a city where, I mean, if he had, I, I truly was surprised that he was surprised. I mean, I, I, I would not be caught dead there holding my partner's hand, or maybe I would. And that's the problem. And so I, it, it's very interesting to sort of think about how sort of there's this remembered uh, fear that ends up being in the community. And, um, you know, it, it may start with a hate crime. It may go the opposite way. It may be fear that results in a hate crime. Um, but the, these really do have these ripple out effects. Um, and one thing, I, one thing I'd like to mention in particular are hate crimes against people who are transgender. Um, they tend to be incredibly violent, really heinously violent. Um, like one woman who is beaten to death with a fire extinguisher. Um, and her assailant uh, said that he believed he had killed it, um, which was one of the reasons they were able to prosecute it as a hate crime. But you know, transgender people face all kinds of stigma every single day of their life. Um, trans people have two times the rate of unemployment of other people. 47% um, of them uh, report that they've had adverse um, employment actions taken against them. Either they've been fired or passed over for a promotion or not hired um, because they're transgender. And transgender people live um, are in two times the rate of poverty um, that other people are. And you know, those are not hate crime, hate crimes, any of them. That those are just statistics. But I think that they reflect when you're a person who is afraid to go out into the world because your intimate partner might beat you to death with a fire extinguisher. Um, and that the community may or may not react to that in a way that you feel is appropriate. That when you live your life under a curtain of fear, there are these implications that come out because of that. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting. I went to law school literally next door. I went to Mason. So um, coming here this morning was a little bit strange for me. Um, and the tenor of conversation in this room, this, this peacemaking room, as opposed to the tenor of conversation in the law school next door is pretty striking. I, I assume those of you who are Masonites know about the dynamics there. Um, it's a very conservative law school. But it even struck me in the panel this morning, which was so inspiring and terrific, that there is a, a true gap between what we can prosecute and the bad things that happen. Right? So um, in the law school, they're going to be talking in, well, if it was a regular law school, they'd be talking about civil rights, right? And they'd be really concerned about that um, instead of just Second Amendment. But <coughs> anyway, <laughs> my little brief. <laughs> um, but in here, we're, that's not what we're talking about. You know, I mean, this morning we were talking about First Amendment rights, right? And where the First Amendment and the and hate crime sort of hit up against each other and what's appropriate to be prosecuted as a hate crime and what are hate incidents and other things hate speech and how about just hate 
and the hate itself has a lot of implications that are really important. And so that's sort of where I bring you back to this idea that you know trans people are often living in fear. They're living in fear of their personal safety. They're living in fear of losing their job. They're living in fear of coming out of the closet. Um, and one of the other things that I do a lot in my jobs work on uh, non-discrimination ordinances and um, and laws and having people part of that process is saying, okay, we're going to have the city council um, think about this ordinance. We need some people from the community to come and tell their stories of discrimination. There are a lot of good reasons why a trans person would not want to come forward and tell their story of discrimination. One, they might be fired because probably the reason we're passing the non-discrimination ordinance is so that they can't get fired from their job just because of their gender identity. But also, they really are opening themselves up to violence and hatred. And by coming out in public that way, it is a terrifying thing to do. And it's really difficult um, to have us sort of push for this legislation when people aren't willing to come up. But what are you gonna say? You know, I mean, of course, people feel more comfortable being in the closet for so many really important reasons. So and that's one of these ripple effects that comes out. It's really hard to sort of break out of that cycle. And I also think that there is um, some question the other way. You know, the LGBT movement has moved incredibly rapidly as a civil rights movement. I mean, are the pace, um, and this is because we stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us, but the pace of change about LGBT rights has come so quickly. It's a benefit and it's also a huge drawback. Um, and we see the case of Matthew Shepard, talking about Matthew Shepard, having sexual orientation and gender identity um, and gender be part of the Hate Crimes Prevention Act is huge, and having that ability to protect is huge, but that doesn't mean that people are no longer have discrimination against gay and uh, lesbian and um, transgender people. And so I think we also have to make sure that we're, we're remembering that just because we have the law does not mean the problem is solved, right? Um, and that there is a really um, big difference between having peace and having uh, a place where people are safe to come out and be the best people that they can be and contribute to their community and give all of the gifts that they have and give those back. Um, there's a huge difference between that and what we have, um, even though we can all recognize how far we've come from where we were. So uh, it's a continuing journey. Um, and I would also make a similar um, a series of comments regarding youth. Um, I think, you know, recently we've seen that there's been this huge spate of LGBT young people who have chosen to take their own lives. Um, and thankfully that has slowed down. There was a series of very high profile suicides a couple years ago that was incredibly disturbing. And uh, you may be familiar with the It Gets Better project, which was, I think, one of the really cool things that came out of that. Um, but you know, youth report, the LGBT youth report that they're twice as likely to be harassed in school as non-LGBT youth. 51% um, of LGBT youth say that they've been harassed at school, verbally harassed. Um, they're also twice as likely to be physically assaulted, um, kicked, punched, whatever. Um, and they also report that they're twice as likely to be excluded by their peers when they're in peer situations. Um, again, is any of that hate crime? No, none of that is hate crime. But when there are these messages that are sent out to the community about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, and when what's being put out is that being LGBT is wrong, um, they also, 92% of LGBT youth say they hear negative messages about being LGBT, 92%. And four in 10 of those kids say that they're hearing that from their state government, and a third are saying they're hearing that from their local government. I mean, that's really, really upsetting. This, that these aren't just sort of, you know, personalized cultural issues. These are our government uh, that should be treating all people equally, or sending out these messages to these kids that these kids are broken and wrong, and that those messages get perpetuated, um, and that they also are part of this huge ripple effect, right? So they come out and it makes it seem okay that in schools that kids are allowed to talk like this. Now, you know, that's not a hate crime. It's maybe a hate incident. It's maybe a lot of things. Um, but you know, when we're talking about bullying in schools, this is something that can have real long-term damage for kids. 
And it is an outgrowth of the messages that we have as a community are sending. And so I think, you know, this all gets, this following the ripples out to pull the ripples back in a little bit, there is something that our government can do that says, okay, treating people, um, hurting people because they are something that you don't like and you don't understand isn't okay. And, you know, there also in the previous panel, there's a conversation about things coming from the federal government as opposed to from the state government. Unfortunately, sometimes civil rights things do need to come from the federal government because that's the way that it goes, that it gets rippled out. Um, and hopefully it'll get rippled out to every state. But I remember, I think it was Oklahoma, that right after the Hate Crimes Prevention Act, Act passed, they passed a law saying they weren't going to comply. Is that Oklahoma? There was a, res a resolution about that. Yeah, that, that was pretty great. <laughs> but they're you, you still complying. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, there there's going to be every time there's an action like this, there's going to be a reaction, right? And hopefully, as we're able to sort of you know push the envelope, and then it comes back, and then we push the envelope a little bit more, and it comes back, and hopefully one day we will make it so that everyone is able to really be part of a community where they can give out their best back to their community, and that they're not kept from doing that because of who they are. So that's it. Thanks. Um, I, I'm a former thespian, so I'm really, really sure you're going to be able to hear me, and I'm worried that I'll like blow up the mic if I use it, so I won't. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks. I'm really happy to be here. I'm a huge fan of the CRS. Um, I really admire their work, respect their work, um, and have great uh, a, a great sense of the aspirations of the people that work for CRS and the organization itself. Um, and the reason that I said that I would agree to participate in this panel is because of, of you. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about the federal government, there's been a lot of talk about state government, there's been a lot of talk about law, but really your involvement, your interest in this issue is as individual change agents. The law is a blunt instrument. We can find people, we might be able to find them after they commit a hate crime. Most hate crimes are not prosecuted. You'll not be surprised to hear. So the question for us and the question for you as peacemakers, as conflict resolution specialists, devoting your careers and your um, uh, future to this work is preventing these crimes from happening in the first place. And there is much that can be done in that arena. The first thing is, and i just picking up on what, what Kate had said, is to recognize the pain, the impact of these types of crimes, the seriousness of these types of crimes. Roy talked about it as the purpose of these crimes is to affect the entire community. And so that means if these are message crimes, that we, the community, you as change agents in these community um, uh, settings, must be able to push back and send a message to the haters that they are the ones uh, that are rejected. They are the ones who are uh, in the minority. Not, we're not going to sit back and, and just take it. Um, there is a, uh, the most important Supreme Court case involving a cross burning is a case called uh, Virginia against black. Um, it involves a Klan member, one, and then there was another one that burned a cross on his neighbor's uh, lawn. So the Klan burned it in a cornfield. And they said, we have a you know, First Amendment right to, to do this. And the other people uh, put it in a, you know, just burned it on the front lawn of, uh, of their neighbor who had just moved into the neighborhood. And there was a, an amazing exchange. One of the great things about my job working for the ADL, we filed a brief in Virginia against black. I went to the oral argument. Uh, and there was this amazing moment where the uh, attorney who was not representing the Klan, he was representing the First Amendment, had this exchange with the bench, with the Supreme Court justices. And they were talking about, you know, what about a gun? What if a gun's unloaded? And then he had this exchange. Uh, this is the First Amendment lawyer. Um, if I take a torch, uh, what would be the difference, he said, between brandishing a torch and brandishing a cross. And he you know, took his hands and went like this. And Justice Kennedy, and if you've ever been in the Supreme Court, the person who's arguing is incredibly close to the nine justices. Justice Kennedy leaned over the bench and said, the difference is 100 years of history. 
And that was the end of the case. Nobody needed to say anything else. They were going to find a way to uphold this cross-burning statute in Virginia, and they did. A hundred years of history. There is a context here. The context is stuff that y'all can work on. There is discrimination. You know that. And so the question is, what are we going to do about it? People do not burn parallelograms on the front lawn of black families that just moved into the neighborhood. Why don't they burn parallelograms? No one would know what the charred remains of a parallelogram mean when you wake up in the morning or when you find it at 2 o'clock in the morning. But everybody knows what a burning cross means. It's terrorism. Um, and we need to be able to push back. And that's where you come in. Two final points. Number one, you do not have to reinvent the wheel. You're hearing about this hate crime. There's that Matthew Shepard Act, 18 U.S.C. 245, 249, blah, 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 blah. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of law, 45 states in the District of Columbia. You can look at the Virginia law. Go to the ADL website and find it. Um, and there are a lot of really good resources. I just brought a couple with me today just to hold them up, but they exist on the web, which is the only place they need to exist. The Organization of Chinese Americans has a fantastic community guide called Responding to Hate Crime. The organization PFLAG, Parents of Lesbians and Gays, Parents and Family of Lesbians and Gays, has a great hate crime prevention guide and toolkit for the community. And, uh, and then there's the FBI. You know, I don't know that uh, a civil rights lawyer, a civil rights activist, community peacemakers would think of the FBI as a source for an effective tool, but this is the best hate crime manual on the planet. And the reason it's the best hate crime manual at FBI.gov is because they worked with the HRC, the Anti-Defamation League, the National Center for Transgender Equality, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, the American Association of University Women. That's the partnership that we've been talking about. Um, and every CRS office is listed in this manual. The definitions are the definitions that we helped to write. The scenarios are the scenarios that we helped to write. It's the best hate crime training manual on the planet. And that's pretty cool. And then the last point I want to make is we cannot prosecute or legislate or regulate hate crimes out of existence. That is not going to happen. And that is where you come in. Wherever you're going to be scattered after learning how to be the best peacemakers and conflict resolvers that you can be, you're going to be in a community working with others who also have a goal in mind to prevent these crimes, respond effectively after they respond. We should not rely, even with the extraordinary work of the CRS, with the great work of the FBI, the civil rights prosecutors, those are not the guys, those are not the women that we have to rely on. We have to rely on community members and people that are leaders and change agents in these communities to make a difference. I'm not a thespian, but I did say the hobby in last night. Um, I do want to say, I do feel a little bit like um, I'm following Buster Posey, uh, batting third here from the San Francisco Giants. So I'm going to do my best to follow up uh, with Michael, what Michael said. I, want, I do want to say thank you again to Dean Bartoli uh, for hosting this event. I, I do want to say, very much picking up on what Michael said, uh, that you are peacemakers. You've chosen a, a path here. So where I want to take my remarks in following on, 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 on Kate and, and what she really said about you know, what is still going on out there, especially from the LGBT issues. It is somewhat misleading sometimes, right? When all this great, it is an amazing time to be, to honestly, be part of the administration and, and working on these issues today. I, I've seen it, even in the short period that I've been in the administration, uh, how, the, how we think differently about, about the issues. And, and, and I really do appreciate the great work that Harpreet and all our conciliators do throughout the country. Uh, Roy said we had two people throughout the country. It's actually, it's actually, it's actually 50 people. We have 50 people spread out in 10 regional offices and, and four field offices and, and one and one headquarters office. And it, it, it is really, truly, I think like for many of you, a, a calling uh, that people have and that's that's why that's that's why they that's why they do. We, we hope to have a George Mason student interning with us, Jared Arthur, 
uh, very soon as well. He has to go through security clearance. That takes a while sometimes uh, to, 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 to get through. So, uh, and why I feel very privileged is that I, I left academia to, to, to do this, to do this job. And so it, again, it's, it's, it's a nice coming home for me here today. And, and I, will, I will come up, I, I, I warned my staff that this would unleash my inner academic again, coming back here. And I do want to talk about it from that perspective. As a, as a person who's the director of a conflict resolution center, who focused at it from, uh, what, what I really do love about George Mason is that it's a, theory and practice, that it is both about both those things um, and, and, and the way that you approach it. And again, um, as, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this has been a place of, of folks who are, who are practitioners at CRS, like Wally Warfield and Jim Lowey, who became academics and who took what they did in the field and said, what can we do to, to, to bring back to, to students who would then become peacemakers to actually make a difference, uh, make a difference out there. And, and so, so I would start by saying, you know, CRS and Harpreet said this very well. You know, we have we have certain things that we do out in the field. And and for those of you familiar with a person named Bill Yuri, he was a co-author of a book called Getting to Yes, very much focused on international uh, diplomacy. Very focused. It was very focused on South Africa, on Ireland, and peace processes there. Uh, he wrote a book called Getting to Peace, and the the three main ways that a third party can play a role in peace are in uh, containment, right? One's containment, that some incident has happened, some horrible incident has happened, and people are just in denial, people are angry. So the role that you're playing often is a referee, a referee, a witness to it, uh, and, and that's what some of the things that I think Harpreet was talking about. In the very beginning, in the Oak Creek situation, it's just about finding out what's going on. It's just about conveying information. One thing that CRS has always done in, as a first responder in these situations is get accurate information out there. There, was, there were rumors, that I was in the car with Harpreet as he's on the phone in the Dallas airport going, going to our hotel uh, that there was a second shooter in that situation. And it was believed for quite a bit of time. It wasn't just that day, it, it happened for a bit of time. It's then listening to people, right? People are angry, people are scared. And what, what did uh, Harpreet, what did Mangarecki do as the regional director there? They had a forum for people who were scared. 250 people, 72 hours after the incident. That's, so that's, you know, there's, a, there's a containment piece. You can't get the piece right away. It's just about can you just witness? Can you just, uh, just stop, the, stop it from getting worse? You know, the second piece uh, that Yuri identifies, and actually he does, he does 10 larger roles, but the three main ones are, uh, than in resolving issues. Right? There, there's a lot of what, what CRS does is mediate. There are conflicting interests in a situation. Uh, there may be situations, uh, I can't go too, too deeply, but there were still issues that had to be resolved. People who, in the Oak Creek incident, for example, couldn't have visitors because they didn't have any relatives who lived in the United States at the time, for example. The, when would the Gurdwara reopen? It was a crime scene and people wanted to worship. There are these issues where there are some conflicting interests, they have to be resolved. And the third, the third, the third piece that uh, Yuri talks about um, is prevention. And, and a lot of what, what this is today about, right, is about prevention. It's about equipping folks with, with what, what is the difference between a hate incident and a hate crime. Uh, it, is, it is focusing on, oh, and, and law enforcement is a, is a key piece. 70% of our work involves that. If, if we went back again to the, um, the Oak Creek incident, it was working with sick leaders throughout the country. How could they make their Gurdwaras safer? Right? How, how, could they work, how could law enforcement work with them? And, and, and that's, a, that's a key player in that. So those, really, I think that's, that's a lens that I bring to this, this work. And, and something that, as the main four things that, that, that um, Harpreet talked about, we do mediation, Mediation, right? We're trying to mediate towards agreements. We facilitate for dialogue. We're trying to create the dialogue of people who have disagreements, people who are angry. We're trying to listen a lot. Uh, Roy, uh, it was amazing how well er Eric and Roy was talking about doing a much better job of selling CRS than I than I could. Uh, but it's true. It's about trust building. It's about people who, who, at, who at time may not trust law enforcement. They may not trust other parts of the Department of Justice. 
but that is something that we can bring to the table because we are in the field. We, we do have the relationships with emerging communities, LGBT communities, uh, leaders, and sometimes when there isn't a national organization uh, at times uh, uh, as, as well. So again, those are, the, those are the four. We have mediation, uh, facilitation, training. Uh, I, I, I was witness to a training that one of our conciliators, Mohammed, did uh, around Arab, Muslim, and Sikh issues with the Worcester police. I, I, I spent a little time in Massachusetts, so I try to say it correctly, at Worcester, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, and working with police cadets, young men and women uh, who will be police officers throughout, throughout Massachusetts. And it is powerful to see a training in which people understand aspects of the Sikh religion, of the Islam religion, better. And I, it is when where it becomes less foreign, less strange. And, and our conciliator Muhammad did a wonderful job of, of saying what's similar about Christianity to uh, the Islamic religion and to, to to, to a variety of religions. It, it, it brings it, it makes it more, it, it, it brings out the us versus them, right? What, when, when you're in peace, it's about overcoming the us versus them. It's, it's, making, the, it's making us one we uh, in, in that case. And that's, I think that's part of the, the, the work that happens in, in the training aspect uh, there. Uh, just one quick example uh, of, of this. Uh, so on July 19, 2012, I saw it on CNN, you may have saw it, where a, a seven-year-old boy uh, in Detroit has several sisters and a, and a mom in the house. So he's the only boy in the house, and he is being bullied. He is being bullied at school and in his neighborhood uh, on a gender basis. He's being called a girl, right? You know, you must be a girl. You, you, all you got around you is girls. And, and so he, he gets this, and he's seven-year-old. He jumps out of his ninth-floor apartment building. A really, a real tragedy that, that happens here. And as you can imagine, the, the, the community's just really upset about it, right? And what's, and, and CRS, we, we play a role in it. I, you know, it's, it's only, it's a, it's, a, it's a small role, but it's a role in it, right? And when, Eric talks about it when Drew talks about getting the right people to the table. I was, and I say this to you as, as peacemakers today and peacemakers in the future, the one thing I've seen, and I've been, I've been in the dispute resolution business from a private side, from a nonprofit side, from an academic side, the interesting thing I think as being a part of the government, as being a part of the Department of Justice, is that you, what I think CRS does incredibly well is get the right people to the table, have the relationships. Uh, Drew mentioned uh, Scott, I mean, uh, Tommy Battles, who does an incredible job of knowing seemingly every congressional member, seemingly every important person in the entire South. <laughs> but he gets the right people in front of the FBI, in front of the Civil Rights Division, in, in front of that. And there's a way in which we've always been, I think, more in some ways a bridge between the communities to law enforcement. When I speak with LGBT groups, that's what they. That's where they say, yeah. That's the work where the work still has to be. It's with law enforcement. That's still a bridge that still has to be, has to be, has to be built. But that is, I would say, the convening ability of CRS is a unique asset. Uh, it, it happened in a situation uh, with Charles Phillips, a conciliator who works with uh, Harpreet, where, and I don't go into the details of it, but law enforcement did not want to come to the table over a hate incident. But because when we said we would like to mediate here because there was a conflict between the community and law enforcement, uh, the, the law enforcement came to the table. So that is, I think, something not 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 um, happily uh, to it, uh, but but they but they did. And and coming back to this situation in Detroit, it's one where there was a lot of anger, and so really what uh, Deidre McGee did, who's the conciliator out of Detroit, did was bring together people and just listen to them. That's something that people, it's amazing, I know for all of you who in the dispute resolution world, you know how important it is to be heard. Just to be heard. Especially when you're in denial, especially when you're in anger about something. So, that, so that's a piece of it there. Uh, and clearly, what was, it, what was interesting there was 
some students in a high school, Renaissance High School in Detroit said, we want to do something about this. And, th and they got in contact with CRS, and CRS then worked, Deidre then worked with getting together folks from Detroit, the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, children's centers, the parent-teacher organizations, and they formed, they helped create a, a memo of understanding of how, how the community would do better to prevent bullying of this nature, where they actually said, this is the type of training we'll do, this is what the police will do, and, and, and all that. So it's, again, here's a service that can be provided. Given CRS's experience with these sort of things, then Deidre can say, here's some advice on, 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 on how to handle it now. Here's a best practice that you could take from a consulting perspective. Uh, so, again, I, you know, with the lens of a dispute resolution approach, it is saying, here are our, it's really trying to analyze the situation and, and then figure out, as, as the earlier panel was saying, it's, it's really, there's a, there's a chaotic number of parties involved. I think what CRS can help identify is making the introductions to the parties, getting the right parties to the table, and, and deliver some services, but really it's in partnership with a lot of different folks. It's in partnership with the FBI, it can be in partnership with the Civil Rights Division, the U.S. Attorneys, the local human relations commissions, uh, the advocacy organizations, it, it really can be that way. Um, Eric mentioned the work in Puerto Rico. I don't want to go too deeply into that, but because I, I think I want to get into the conversation. Uh, but that's a situation where there were 18 transgender murders in Puerto Rico between 2010 and 2012. Mostly, I, I don't know the exact number of which were trans um, or prostitutes uh, in, in, in Puerto Rico. And Renaldo Rivera and Linda Peace Again, and this Puerto Rico is a very unique place. Renaldo likes to Saying this is what you got to do, and this is what you got to do, but is it does something get lost in translation? Right? Uh, Daphne, who's here, has done some work, for example, in Puerto Rico, and, and can attest to some of that as well. And one of the first things we do is what just identify the problem. There's a lack of hate crime uh, training protocols, lack of sensitivity training for the officers, lack of hate crime bias crime reporting, need for a hate crimes advisory board, an anti-hate campaign. There's a lot that had to be had to be done. What, what Ronaldo and Linda really brought to it was a process, a, a, from a peace perspective, a sustainability perspective, sort of a process consultant perspective. What needs to happen? What are the logistics? It's like air traffic control. What, what then needs to happen? Who needs to be trained on hate crimes, right? We're talking about lots of different folks here, judges, prosecutors, police, and often and, and there are certain folks who are just not accustomed to this issue. And of course, the big concern, as Kate was talking about, is um, the reluctance to come forward because of issues with the police uh, in, in, in Puerto Rico. But what I think in working with uh, the community-oriented policing uh, service, uh, COPS, that's part of DOJ that, does, that, that focuses on, on that, and I know I think uh, George Mason actually does a little bit of work uh, with COPS and, and Bureau of Justice Assistance as well in community policing, is is working and bringing in other parts and helping them manage it right. Because there's always those cultural issues, right? There's always those things that happen in, in, in doing that. So it's really thinking through all the players. It's thinking through who to convene. It's thinking through how to implement something uh, as, as, best, as best you can uh, in, in, terms, in terms of that. Um, in, so I'll, I think I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop there for, for, for now, uh, but I, what I think it's worth, well, what I'll, what I'll end with is, is, in, is the model that uh, I work with. I, I worked in the Hard Negotiation Project. I, be, I, I first got my first class in 1988, so I've been working on the, 1989. So it's been 23 years of working through it, and for the fundamental premise, right, of getting to yes, is that get, get the interest behind the positions, right? That you should brainstorm, you should really understand the underlying needs in order to get to something creative. Uh, so for me, this is a fascinating journey of how dispute resolution can, 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 can prevent and respond to, to, to hate crimes. And what the, 
what often happens, I think, in these situations is that people just, say in Puerto Rico, they're not going, they're, there might be a resistance place because they're saying, hey, you, Ameri you, know, you Americans, you don't know what you're doing, or you mainlanders, like mainlanders, I should be careful. Uh, mainlanders, <laughs> you gotta be very, very, uh, you, you don't know what you're doing. They might passively, they might say yes, but they might not really implement it well. They might re actively resist it. Uh, if you think about whenever CRS goes into a situation, whether there's been a crime committed or not, and the community just totally, like I'm from Cal uh, the Bay Area, Oakland, California, where there was a military state between the police and the African American and Latin uh, Latino communities. Are you going to trust the other party? Are you, uh, you know, is that going to happen? I think you can't talk honestly without trust. Very little is possible, right? Without trust, you're not going to believe one thing the other per person says. Uh, a conciliator uh, that I just talked to yesterday, Rosa Salamanca working in Wyoming without a federal hate crimes, excuse me, without a state hate crimes uh, prevention statute, said basically how important, what she really does is with, between law enforcement and community when it comes, especially there, between whites and, 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 and tribes, is how to get people to, to trust each other. If, if the law enforcement only says these five words that we are aware that there is a potential of a hate crime here. She said that the American the tribal members give a big sigh of relief. Not that there is a hate crime, but just that they're aware of it. It helps build trust. If there's a phone call made by the community member to the law enforcement, and law enforcement says, don't bring us these things, it's, it's very different than they call right away and say, well, let's have a meeting about it. There's a huge difference in terms of trust. I think what CRS does is help do that. I hope that's helpful. I'm trying to bring it from a conflict resolution lens to the kind of work, whatever kind of work that you all do. And again, uh, I, I, I hope that this provides some insights for that as well. Thank you.